So, second thing, so we started our sources, having a look at our sources of information. One of our big sources of information as to what we can do on a parcel of land is the zone. So, and that and it's, this cuts right to right to what we're doing in this subject. You know, for planning approval, planning approval has to happen in accordance with that. So, we've got our you know, the you know, we've got the metropolitan area divided up into various different different councils, and then in the outer metropolitan area divided up into cities and councils, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, so on and so forth. All of those councils will have their development plans. So the reason they have their development plans is because they want cohesive use and habitation of areas. You know, they don't want leather tanneries right next to um, you know, urban developments and they don't want lead smelters anywhere near schools, that sort of thing. So they have to separate all these things. The way they do that, the way they lay down the law is through their development plan. I say lay down the law, they're not hard and fast. Like anything, it's open to interpretation. I'm not saying go out there and, and, and be a pain and try to try to apply some interpretation that's, that's unreasonable to these things. But the way that within a development plan, it gives general language because it's really difficult to say specifically, like, you must do this one thing. Because if they do say, you must do this one thing, then we'll only ever have this one thing done. So there has to be um, the inclusiveness enough to, to have some, some site-specific buildings, some variability, etc., but have some lines in the sand to say, we don't want these cert certain sort of things to be happening. Like we, you know, in the main, we want buildings that have windows on the front. We don't want just blank facades, walls, really tall walls, you know, that are painted black, etc. So there, there are certain things that we can all agree on, well, pretty much all of us now, you know, you know can't all agree on, but the vast majority of people can agree on, this is what we want. That's what drives those development plans. As I mentioned before, we're going, we're undergoing a great deal of upheaval with the, the planning, well, uh, no, not the a change. So we've got a new Development Act. So the Development Act says councils can impose their zoning. Among other things, it's a very much longer document than that, but it says that councils can impose their zoning. The new Development Act, it's about actually having a planning development and infrastructure framework for the whole place, and it's meant to replace those individual um, development plans for councils and at the same time enable private planners to be assessing planning applications independent of, of councils. So we're going to see far more homogeneity but exactly how that's all going to be, how that will um, play out, you know, we, we're yet to find out. We'll, we'll find that out over the next, next few years. So it's something that you're going to have to watch and observe and see and look for for opportunities or, or or ways that you have to have to change. So, as I mentioned before, a great place for getting information about all those changes is the SA planning portal. So you can keep abreast of that via that. But also, information on the SA planning portal about that. But I haven't checked out the stuff up there right right now. Um, but just until recently still not a great deal of information about it. So you may want, um, if you're a member of the Building Designers Association, possibly they, hopefully they will they will be running a, a course on this sometime soon. Master Builders ran one fairly fairly recently. I couldn't couldn't make it. You went to that one? Oh great. Oh could you <laughs> let me know what yeah. Uh, actually uh, I, I was late and uh, uh, there was Yeah. 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 Oh, cool. Yeah. Um. So, but if you if you're a member of these these industry bodies, yeah, you've you've got got that opportunity to go to these to these, these seminars on. And um, 
Yes. Uh, yes, definitely. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And so it's yeah. So you know, for many reasons, it's good to be be part of one of these industry bodies. But yeah, if nothing more, yeah, the information seminars and keeping yourself updated because yeah, you do have insight, much better insight into this information than what is just put on the planning planning portal. That's that's more for the general public, and you know. As people who work in the industry, you want, you know, want to dig a bit deeper than that, in the main. But um, also on the on the planning portal is a bunch of information that is is relevant to us. We've got a few options. We could go to the planning planning portal to get our development plan. So we've got development plan library. So we can go there. Um, or there's online zoning map as well. But for the online zoning map, we could also go to SA Map Viewer. For our development plans, we can get that via the council website. So if we're doing council stuff or SA Map Viewer stuff, you don't really have to go to this one. You can get them from the other places where you are. Um, so that's, oh, excuse me, that's one location for that information. So we've got got our city of Unley open at the moment. Unley development plan. Um, oh, let's do an application form. Oh, we we had a link to it just before, didn't we? Um, Unley development plan. Oh, there it is. Sorry, I was just couldn't see it for being blind. Unley city development plan. So that's pretty much what a development plan is going to look like. So, yeah, soon these are going to be, well, I, I maybe it's a bit too much for me to say they're going to be obsolete, but the, the idea is to transition to a new system that does not rely on these. So, what we see in these are, well, down our left hand side, like, like, any, like any form of PDF, we've got our, um, Got a, got a list of contents that we can we can click on. You have both. Well, this is council wide. That's council wide objectives. So it says what what that what the council want, and we will see different council wide objectives in Unley than we will see in the Adelaide Hills. Adelaide Hills they want you know small semi rural properties that have a certain certain attractiveness and charm to them. Only wants far greater density of development, etc. They, they have different concerns, looking after people primarily with, with different interests. So they're going to have a unique council-wide objectives. But what you will notice is that there is a great deal of commonality between councils on things as well, and that you know what's in the council-wide objectives for Unley will look very much to like Charles Sturt or Mitcham or or other similar uh, similar areas. So you'll see a lot of commonality as well. Um, so we've got design and appearance, energy efficiency, form of development, etc. Things like you know things like energy efficiency. Well, that's going to be um, going to be pretty much word for word across your develop across your across your councils. But then so there's our council wide objectives. But we know that we our particular place has a zone, so we could also so we'll also look at our particular zone. There we go, residential historic conservation, and then under that residential historic conservation, we have policy areas. So we want to go back to our SA map viewer, our landscape, uh, sorry, uh, land management. We'll Want to put on? Can anybody tell me what we want to put on? Oh, land development plan zone categories. And we'll go what's here. So, 
Residential Historic Conservation, Policy Area GH7. So Policy Area 7, Grand Historic. So got Residential Historic and then Policy Area number 7. That's so we'll be wanting to read that. Now, however you whether you want to look at the big picture, medium, small, and minute picture, or whether you want to start with the minute picture and work your way out, it's kind of the same. Whatever you think is going to get you all the answers you need. For this class, I prefer to look at the big picture first. Let's have a look at council-wide objectives, get a feel for only, and then we can look at residential historic, and then we'll get down into to our local policy area. But just understand that there are your various different tiers and that if the council-wide objectives say we want houses to be maximum height of 6.5 but then we get into the historic conservation policy area and it says maximum building heights of 5 metres, what do we go with? Five metres, that's it. So the, so the most specific information to your property is the, is the piece that takes precedence. Any ideas why we then start with council-wide objectives and move into specific? Because our specific is going to be very specific. It's not going to cover everything. And so there's going to be a bunch, if we just read the specifics, if we just read the historic, um, well, and that, that policy area, it's going to tell us a few things, but it's only going to be a sh very short section. And there might, might be other things in relation to um, amount of private open space, allotment frontage, all these sorts of things that are not mentioned specifically in our policy area, but are mentioned in the council-wide objectives. If we don't have any conflicts, well then, what's in the council-wide objective, objective stands as well. So everything we have to make decisions about is a summation of what's in there and what's in the residential zone or what's in residential historic and then what's in our policy area. It's all of those things all put together. But as we get smaller and smaller and smaller, those smaller bits take precedence over the other bits. That, in a nutshell, is how you read a development plan. So council-wide, look, we're not going to read the whole development plan um, or the whole council-wide objectives either. What will we want to look at? Centres and shops? Probably not. Commercial industrial development? No. Community? No. Crime prevention? Maybe, but no. Um, like crime prevention is going to come into play. They talk about fences, like being able to look through a fence, um, hedges, things. So they might, you know, if we were we were doing, if we were working specifically on this on this property and not just running a class, yes, we would look at crime prevention because there are going to be some impact. There may be some impact there on what we can do with fences and landscaping. Design and appearance. Design and appearance is what we are going to look at most most definitely. We're not going to go past that. Energy efficiency. Yeah, we'll look at that one. Um, forms of development. Yeah. Uh, hazards, heritage, we might want to have a look at heritage for this one. Um, interface between land uses, possibly, possibly not. Um, land division, do we, want to, do we want to do a subdivision? Um, if we do, maybe, yeah, anyhow. So, yeah, landscaping, good one to look at. So I'll make that slightly larger to, so design and appearance, development of of a high des design standard and appearance that responds to and reinforces positive aspects of the local environment and built form. Very broad, nebulous statement. You know, we could, yeah, yeah. Um, development of a high, of high, high design standard and appearance that responds to and reinforces positive aspects of the local environment and built form. So what they don't want is your your base model, well, I'm not going to call out any building companies, but like a very cheap building company, they don't want that there. That's what, you know, 
higher design standards. But you know that's so open to interpretation, and 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 where these things are open to interpretation, you you might get councils that say no, we don't don't want to consider that, and you can say, but my development is of a high design standard. We we're just interpreting this differently, and, and so you can, they, there's um, it can be yeah can be explored. Roads, open spaces, paths, open land uses laid out and linked so that they are easy to understand and navigate. Well that's not really us for our, for our allotments, that's more, more for the council. Um, buildings should reflect the desired character of the locality while incorporating contemporary designs that have regard to the following. Building height, mass, proportion and sighting. Now one thing you're going to see within other areas of the development plan is you're going to see setback of this particular distance. So we'll say this is what your setback is allowed, and you'll have, um, you know, a specific one for your area. Now I said earlier that what's in your specific bit takes precedence over the council-wide objectives. You can still argue some of these things on these points because if they say your setback is 12 metres, but then every other building is set back 8 metres. You can say, but in your council-wide objectives, you're saying, um, while incorporating contemporary that have regard, um, would reflect the desired character of the locality. So you say, well, the, 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 lo the locality has all the buildings at 8 metres. You know, my proportion and siting should be the same as those, as those because it reflects the desired um, character of the locality. External material, and so, and that's, and that's the same for, for all these, all these things. So there, sometimes, what's mentioned in the development plan may be slightly in conflict to what's expressed, you know, or what, what, has, what you have on, on your property. So, and so you can apply that same rule to to every one of these. So external materials, roof form and pitch, facade, articulation, detailing, veranda, these, etc. Um, yeah, what won't spend too much too much time. This is this is for you at home to have a really good well the, our subject property is not in Hunley. So don't read the Hunley one. You'll read you'll read the one that's appropriate to our property. But have a have a good good read of this one at home. Um, or these things at home. So um, we've got information about, about balconies. It says balconies should, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Development adjacent heritage places. Well we're in a heritage place, <coughs> won't get that so much. It covers overshadowing. And visual privacy. So there are constraints around overshadowing and visual privacy. So in our in our historic conservation zone or our policy area, it may say nothing about overshadowing, but that still applies to us. So design and location of buildings should enable direct winter sunlight into adjacent dwellings and private open spaces, minimise the overshadowing of windows of habitable rooms. So you can obscure the window of a laundry, but not of a not of a living area or a bedroom. Upper level private balconies that provide primary open space area for a dwelling, so you can't go shady from these balconies, etc. Um, solar collectors such as hot water systems and photovoltaic cells. So, yeah, that will limit what you can do on your property because you look at where the sun's coming from. So, in this subject, we have to do um, summer and winter solstice shading and, and, and sun paths. Part of the reason for that is to see about the energy efficiency of our building and how that how that works, but also we want to know those sorts of things for neighbouring <coughs> neighbouring properties as well. Visual privacy covers visual privacy, outdoor storage and service areas, building setbacks from road boundaries. So except in areas where a new character is desired, the setback of buildings from public roads should be similar to or compatible with setbacks of buildings on adjoining land and other buildings in the locality. So once again, gives us that that option for for contesting anything imposed, or for not even contesting, but but putting a putting a case forward. 
So you can you can anticipate that there's there's something that needs to be discussed, and you get that in the council if you're writing. In fact, what we do in this in this subject, you have consultation with the um, customer, you have consultation with building design, and then you have consultation with council. So you find out what the customer wants, and then you, you have a chat with the building designer about what the customer wants and what, what we need to do and what things we need to look out for in preparation for talking to the council. So when you talk to the council, you say, well, look, we're doing this, we're looking at siting it here, it's in contravention of this, but it's in harmony with this. We think that this is a probably more, more important than that thing. What do you think? Do you consider that to be a complying development, non-complying development? Um, except where specified in a particular zone. So, as I mentioned before, our particular zones take precedence over the, the council wide objectives. Policy area of precincts, the main face of the building should be set back from primary road frontage in accordance with the following table. So if our zone doesn't say anything about setbacks, if our, our policy area says nothing about setbacks, then straight back to here. That's why we read this one. That's why we read this one first, because we want to we want to know that, okay, um, so this gives us a diagram, so setback, uh, difference between buildings on adjacent allotments up to two meters of, of variation between those. So at, at least the average setback of the adjacent buildings. Um, do we get? Yeah, so that's yeah. They're, they're not actually giving us a, a hard and fast value setback on that one. Um, other things, on-site energy generation development should facilitate the efficient use of photovoltaic cells and solar hot water systems by taking into account overshading neighbouring buildings, design, roof orientation and pictures to maximise exposure to direct sunlight. So they're telling you, angle your roof to be able to have photovoltaic cells in order to capture that, that light and be energy efficient. If there's somewhere else it's saying, well, we want these particular roof pitches or something, some sort of constraint around roof pitch, but you actually want to achieve that, you can say, well, look, it says in your council-wide objectives, this is, you know, this is what you support. Are you able to support that in our case? Um, on the other important aspects. Um, yeah, building heights adjacent to airports, things like that, probably not going to be, be important for us. Um, yeah, it's kind of minor things. Yeah. Um, I won't go, won't read through all of these things specifically. There's there's a lot there's a lot that's not specific to us and also um, that is not, not really necessary for you. But what I do encourage you or what you will have to do at home is go through this process in a little bit more of a thorough fashion than we're doing it right here today with your subject property. So have a have a look at that that subject property, have a look at the procedure document, get an idea about what you're dealing with and then read the relevant development plan in connection with that. So sit down with that at some point. Have a good read. And yeah. And do it do it with the intention of taking snips and things like that and compiling things together. So get a get a Word document open, compile a bit of a list of important things you've got to think about, and then break that up into council-wide objectives, zone, your area, because you want, basically what you want to do is you want to produce a con condensed version of this that's specific to your property. And that will help you go, 
So that will, if you break break your Word document you know, up into those things, that will help you remember. Oh, I got it from the zone specific rather than the council wide, and you know which bit has precedence over each other. Yeah. Yeah. I won't won't pour pour through it any more any more thoroughly than that. Um, Later on in this subject, we'll be looking at regulated and significant trees, but not, not today. Now, we were in residential historic conservation zone, so we'll want to read the, the bit specific to that zone a bit. So, conservation enhancement of heritage values and desired character to describe the respective policy areas. Um, oh, what's going to be good? Um, yeah, you could read, read the, uh, the background to all of that. So, some, some buildings contribute to that heritage value. So, a building making a positive contrib contribution to heritage value and desired character of the respective policy area is termed a contributory item. A, a building which detracts from the heritage value and desired character design is termed a non contributory building. So if you happen to buy the electrical substation building, then that may not be a contributory building. Even though you're within that, you, you don't have, have as many limitations. Development should conserve and enhance the desired character as expressed for each of the seven policy areas. Development should comprise alterations, additions to an existing building, blah. Um, Development should retain and enhance a contributed item by refurbishing, restoring and improving the original fabric and maintaining its streetscape contribution and avoiding works detrimentally impacting on the built form and its characteristic elements, detailing and materials for the front physical size and view. So they're saying you have to preserve the character of those, those buildings and you have to preserve those, those elements. Now, you're not going to have that same problem with our subject property. It's not going to be nearly as restrictive as, as this. They're not going to tell you you have to do that. Um, but they're going to, they will, they will say that you have to be um, not harmonious, but you have to have to have your built form um, of similar character, etc., to, to adjoining, adjoining buildings. So does that just mean the effect of the facade of a historic house? Can you say put an extension on the back even if it's not seen? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it, it does. Well, it look when you when you're dealing with historic stuff, it's all very case specific, and it and it can depend on whether it's state heritage listed or local heritage listed. But then it can also be a, um, in accordance with a document related specifically to that building. So you have you know you have places of high importance, and they'll uh, they'll set set up. You can do this, this, this. You cannot do this, 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 this. Whereas another building that may also be state heritage listed will not have such constraints on it. But then beyond that as well, councils can impose that you have to have a, um, like a an architect who specialises in historic conservation work with that property. That architect will say, you can do this, you can do this, you can't do that. So it is all very case specific. But, like you said, alterations and additions to a contributory item, so that's, that's a building with historic character, should be located primary to the rear of the building and not be visible from the street or any public road unless involving dismantling and replacement of discordant building elements so as to reinstate or better complement the building's original fabric form and key features. So, kind of what you were suggesting there. Build up, you know, they're saying, yes, you can can you make these additions. The zoning allows it. Whether there's something else that says you can't is another matter. Zoning allows it, but they prefer that to be at the back, and they prefer you to knock down the old 1930s lean to addition and do something which is more in the, more in keeping with the original building. So, plenty of constraints around. You know what we can do in this this specific area, and we're and we're working our way 
through that. But then also we remember we're in policy area seven, Grand Unley Park, Haywood Estate. Um, yeah, we don't have time to, to read through all of that. I, I think uh, it's not, but it, you know, it sets out this is what we want. And generous front setbacks of some 11 metres and side setbacks of between 4 metres and 8 metres serves to maintain a total spacing between neighbouring uh, dwelling walls of some 12 metres. So there they're very prescriptive about their setbacks. As I said before, if there are other character constraints or other, other buildings that, that show a particular line, you may be able to have that discussion with council. Um, but council may say, no, that doesn't matter. This takes precedence, and that's up, up to them to make those, those decisions. Um, Dwelling sites typically of no less than 30 metres street frontage and with site areas of 1,500 square metres and as much as 3,000 square metres. Um, so, oh, hey, yeah. What they're not doing there, they're not being hard and fast about something. They're not saying frontages must be a minimum of. They're just giving a description of the area. So there, there may be some, maybe some lenience in that. Yeah. Maintain and respect the grand built scale and form of contributory items and the characteristic, characteristic substantial well of landscaped gardens behind complementary pre preferably open fences. So it gives us some description of what we need to do but then it, there may be elements in that which can be explored. And that's, you know, so there's it's not really for our for our policy area. That one is not really prescriptive. So there's not a lot in that for us. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely take snips of, of this bit here. But yeah, mostly it's going to be what's in that in that zone, and then what's going to be in the council-wide objectives. So that's how we read a development plan. Does that do people feel confident? In, and I don't, don't expect you to be thoroughly confident in this at this point, but confident enough to have a crack. Just go home tonight or, or whenever you can prior to Monday. Have a look at our subject property. Find out what the council area is. Find out what the zoning is. Get that development plan. plan pull it apart. Take lots of snips. Put together a little thing. Get a really good idea of what's relevant to build. So you can, yep. I'd have a crack at that. Well, now, ah, oh, so it's saying it's kind of, yeah, that's really annoying. I guess I don't need to record it. I can get it up on, on everybody's computer individually. So for those at home, what we're, what we're about to do is we've got to, got to take on task one. So complete task one in, in the class today, which we'll primarily be using SA Map Viewer for.